Hello, and welcome back. It's me, Mr. Fowler, and I hope you had a wonderful break, but we are officially back at it here in week 11. Can you believe that? It's crazy. This is also sort of a strange week. Um, it's kind of, whoa, let me get the folks back, sorry. It's kind of a short week. We really have Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Thursday, the college is officially closed, which means that there is no class uh, that will be held on Thursday. And this is kind of odd for you and I, because unless you have a synchronous course in addition to this one, we really don't meet on a certain day or other anyway. But just so you know, I'll be available this week, uh, both Thursday and Friday, even though we're technically not going to be in session. But you can reach out to me on those days. However, that does give us a strange deadline for this week's activity, because this is revision week. Remember that? This is the week where we exchange papers and revise the analysis essay, essay number two, and take care of that process altogether. As such, um, we have a, quite a bit of work to do in a very little amount of time. So I think we're going to have to uh, be cognizant of the time that we do have this week and use it to the best of our ability. Having said that, I want to back up for just a minute. How was your spring break? I hope it was good. I hope it was uh, restful. I hope that you had a lot of time to spend either with your uh, loved ones, your family, or maybe you were just able to forget about your schoolwork for a week and focus on some of the other things that are a part of your very busy lives. Um, I'm going to put this back in the mount here for a moment. Okay. So, I hope that, I hope that it was a restful break for you in some way, shape, or form, or that you were able to maybe just get something done that you were worried about or that you had some anxiety over. Just clarify things so that for today's or this week's work, rather, um, you'll be able to get back into the of things. As we move into the second half of the semester, I know that seems odd, because it really is the second half of our semester. Um, kind of strange. So we've got two really, I mean, we do have to peer review and we have to revise. I get all that. But realistically, uh, after this short week, we're moving on to our third project, the argumentative essay. And that's going to take most of the month of April. So that's pretty much what we'll be doing um, next, starting next week. So we'll start, I think it starts April 4th, and I think our paper's due by April 30th or something like that. So then we'll just have the, uh, the final exam to worry about today. The final exam, by the way, is not technically an exam, it is the final essay. So we'll address that uh, probably in the uh, last week of April, about a month from today. So be prepared for that. Also, we have a couple of discussion questions coming up. There's one in week, so this is week 11. So I think we've got one in week 12 and one in week 13. And then I think there's one more in week 12, 13, take a break. I think it's in week 15, if I remember, if I recall. But we'll see. I might not be perfect on that, uh, but it's in the syllabus. Speaking of the syllabus, there is one minor change I want to address with you. Originally, on the announcements, and I think even in the syllabus, 
I said something along the lines. I made a mistake. Okay? Um, that you could revise this week, and as soon as you were done with the revision, you could submit the final draft of your argument. Uh, sorry, your analysis essay. And I think I said it might even be due by Friday. That obviously doesn't matter. I realize there's a um, you know, an a holiday observation on Friday. And I forgot that. It slipped my mind. So I'm going to officially move that back. And I posted it here on the web page to April 8th. So Friday, April 8th, which I think makes a heck of a lot more sense. You can see it here. So here are our announcements. I'm up here in this corner, huh? Uh, right here, yeah. The final draft of your analysis essay is going to be pushed back to April 8th, not this Friday, in case you're confused about that. Okay. Now that we've said all that, it is, as I said before, peer review week, which means this is an opportunity for you to reach out to one of your peers and exchange essays for their reviewing. And that way, you'll be able to have a different voice um, in your mind, in your head, so to speak, as you get ready to revise the analysis essay, right? Because every paper goes through, Mr. Fowler and Scanner. Every paper goes through four steps, right? Step one is the planning uh, portion. That's where we read through the assignment description and try to figure that out. Step two is the drafting session. Step three is peer review. And step four is revision. So we're in step three currently, right? Uh, we're revising. Or we're peer reviewing. And then we'll revise. So let's take a look real quickly at the kinds of questions that you'll be facing um, as you exchange papers with fellow uh, students. So I'm going to share again. Okay. Remember, last time we read an example from Anonymous, the student who was writing about Dungeons and Dragons. And so her reviewer is just got back from Fort Lauderdale. And again, the title, Dungeons Dragon, Dragons, Reviewing a Decade. And the writer, of course, was on not on this. One of my former students. And um, as it says here, as you read and comment on your workshop partner's paper, or peer review partner's paper, however you like to think of it, reflect on the kind of feedback you would find most helpful were you the one to be receiving it. After all, you're going to get a sample as well. Keep your compatriot apprised of what's working well in his or her draft, as well as specific things that could be improved. The questions below are designed to help you guide your comments with respect to the particular requirements for our second essay assignment. You can expand on the spaces below in the electronic version of this document or on the back of this page or another piece of paper. We probably aren't going to need to do that since we're working on electronically, but I like to read the full instructions just in case. You never can tell what might pop up for somebody in an unexpected way. Is there an effective book that brings you into the paper as a reader? It's always a good idea to bring a paper to the reader, and especially when you're writing a review paper in which you're evaluating a specific criteria. Um, if there is a specific book, take a few minutes to write it below or copy it from the seat paper. That's okay. If you want to make it quick and, and efficient. And then um, if there's not, um, maybe create a little example of something that they could potentially use for a good or effective book. So this particular paper um, shows that Dungeons and Dragons thought to be a launching point of modern role play. The role playing game and to explain how I have to evaluate it makes it essentially agents and who created it. And I feel that's a pretty accurate representation of Anonymous's sentence or book that it brings to uh, the reader. What were the operating criteria? You should have had some operating criteria for evaluation to help your reader understand why you're assessing this object as 
specifically a good version or bad version or a relevant version of what you know, we're after through this paper. And she lists all three of the criteria here. How the game was created and played, the effect it had on the player and the people around it, and how it was incorporated to the game. Identify the thesis statement and then paraphrase it in their own words. This is, I'll admit, a little bit of extra work, but it's good practice to let you paraphrase or experiment with paraphrasing when you have a bit of a safety. If you paraphrase by mistake or in, and plagiarize, it just fellows to this paper. Right? So you're not going to publish this. Um, but she did a nice job, um, and the reviewer. Just, just got back and forth. So Lauderdale did a good job by saying the overall game Dungeons and Dragons has had such major effects on people since it was created back in the late 70s. It's given people a new personality and uh, when it comes to playing in a made up world, uh, it gives people a sense like the Oasis to make a new game. So I thought that was a good connection for this person to make. Like me, uh, Jess got back from Fort Lauderdale. She doesn't have a lot of experience with Dungeons and Dragons. But she was able to extrapolate from the text, Ready Player One, how the role playing elements from the book translate to the, uh, the Oasis and how it's a bridge to something else. Lastly, does he or does she or he use effective in text or parenthetical or excited to to citations? Is the quotation introduced, quoted, and discussed as we showed or as I demonstrated in the sandwich method? And the reviewer says, I would say that work cited page is done beautifully, uh, as well as citing the paper. There were a few mishaps here where uh, citation was placed incorrectly, but that can be fixed. In time. And I think that's an accurate uh, example. Okay. So good example here. Let's stop this. And I think that if you can do this in the uh, short week, again, Monday to Wednesday, you should be uh, pretty good. Okay. Now, if you're working a job or you have a conflict or there's just something else that's going to get in your way this week because of the odd pacing, um, Coming back off the spring break, we know we're going to go into a holiday weekend observation. I don't know why the college chooses to have this, they throw this, you know, other uh, wrench into the works that says, well, by the way, you're not, you know, you're not going to hold class in this. Okay. So I don't know what they really expect out of you as students for three days. <laughs> Hopefully then, my plan that this is going to be an awkward week and it might be a nice sort of comfort week where we can just focus on peer review and still accomplish something in terms of positive forward momentum uh, will work. But if you need to take some time for the first part of this week and you prefer to uh, get some work done on Thursday, I'll still be accepting work on Thursday. Um, in fact, I'll still be work, accepting work on Friday. I know that's an observate, uh, an observed holiday. That's a holiday I happen to observe myself, but I won't do. Uh, I know every, not everybody does it. Right? So I'll, I'll still make myself available for, the, for that day. Right? Um, so you have some options. There. Obviously, Sunday is the uh, major holiday for the weekend. Um, I try to stay flexible on the weekend. I might be less. I might be uh, harder to get a hold of on this weekend than some other weeks. So just uh, reach out to me if there's an emergency, but give me some uh, some leeway, uh, especially once we get past right. Okay. So let's go back real quick to our announcement page. Here I am back up here in the corner again. Okay. Um, remember to exchange and format to the peer review using move my using the class list notification system. I've already had two students who reached out to one another. They've done the peer review. They're just waiting for my grades 
And by the time you see this uh, tomorrow, you too, you, you should have those all back already. And, you know, just go ahead and look out. Oh, there's Taylor. You're on. Same time as your father's on. Uh, so are you, you know, and, and Kenneth and, and Leslie. So anyhow, um, there's uh, Melanick, uh, uh, Jeffrey. Just be sure that if you do link up with somebody that you're respectful, that you are uh, thoughtful about your responses, and that if that person is waiting for you to return a response, that you do. Now back to our announcement. See, we have to look at peer review sample. Ah, we need to look at Fox's piece. Uh, social media is killing our social media. I'll bring that up real quick. Go to the content tab. I'm going to review our reading for students. There's more than three. Oops, sorry. Oh, this doesn't. Three. Maybe there's an argument. There it is. Why social media is destroying us. And I'll put a link to this too so that you're able to find it even more easily than I was. So, um, Jasmine Fox is an interesting writer for the purposes of this class because she was a student writer. And she is um, a student writer who did a nice bit of work and was published in USA Today. She made it. Or rather, a student. And she lays out an argument in a way that I think is both familiar and um, insightful in terms of how to launch a relevant argument for a mass audience. Now, her writing is a little bit shorter than the piece that we're going to look at, but ours is about four and a half pages, the final big paper. The biggest paper you're going to write is ours. But I like to use this as an example for three of these kinds of arguments that we've been working on all semester long. What is that, Mr. Powell? What do you mean working on arguments all semester long? Well, that's what the purpose is behind most of the weekly discussion. You didn't know it, but you've actually been potentially writing the introduction for a argumentative paper over the past several weeks. In fact, you go back to those writings and use your own student writing as a little bit of a launch platform to get you started, if that is those particular argument topics that you're interested in. If they don't, well, you might not be as in a, as a, a cushion in the spot as some of your contemporaries. But if you do like something that happens in your writing, You're going to lose my video for a second, but you should still hear me. And we're going to take a look at thoughts. Now, this is a little bit of an older article, so some of the things that she talks about might be a little bit dated. But you might be surprised at how well this holds up. Um, it's only three pages long. So I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I do want to go ahead and look at a couple of elements. First of all, let's look at the start of this piece. What's the hook? Facebooking, tweeting, and texting are not only the prevalent, but also the preferred forms of communication for many college students and adults today. It's a good hook. He tells you in no uncertain terms what the paper or what the argument is going to be about and why it's relevant. Then she goes on to state her um, 
evidence. Social media interaction now dominates both online and offline conversations. In a society where interacting and oversharing online is more, you're probably more likely to speak to friends and family through electronic devices than you are online. It's a good look. It's a challenge. You know, I, I have something to say in response, whether it's, yeah, you know what, I agree. You are more likely to do that. Or maybe it's true for you, yes, but I have a different view. At least we have some footing here as an audience with which we can respond. But she asks the question, are social media and modern technology destroying our inner personal social skills? Recent research and studies say yes. So this is very unique, especially in reference to our book, Ready Player One. Early in the novel, Wade says, most of my youth was spent online in relation. And consequently, we see him struggling with the ability to make friends and to relate to people in a socially normal way, or what we would perhaps perceive as a socially normal way. He has trouble meeting girls, he has trouble talking to even uh, members of his own gender. He makes connection with age, good. But he even says at one point that girls are about feeling species. I have no idea how to you know, communicate with Now, I think a lot of guys can probably relate to that, be hyperbole with that for some reason. But certainly, you know, you wouldn't want that to be the case. I don't think a lot of us would be. Um, you don't want to exclude yourself from the whole gender worth of conversation. And it goes beyond just girls. And they, you, you really struggle to relate to people in general. And I think that, that some people are becoming so you know, uh, in, enamored of, of this um, break, of this. Uh, separation between who we are as individual people and how we relate in the real world and how we interact and how we online. In the negative zone, we see that people are a lot more cruel, a lot less careful with the ways in which they speak to and about people, the ways in which they communicate um, ideas that are potentially dangerous. And on the other hand, we see some ways in which society has been allowed to relax and in which introverts have been able to reach out to people. Um, some people do better with an interview on camera, per se, than they might be, or they might um, in person. Just more of your personality comes through uh, when there's that, that layer of separation. So I can see some pluses and minuses. However, for those who are struggling with connecting to people, obviously the pandemic has presented some additional challenges. Not only do you have they struggled traditionally, they're probably struggling now because there's no, and then there's no other alternative but to communicate uh, via technology. So she goes on by saying, too often at events, the party's guests are attached to each other, busy tweeting or texting, but no one or very few people are truly engaging or interacting with those around them. And as more generations are born into the social age, social media will probably continue to be favored forms of one of the favored forms of communication among young people. But this may this shift may begin to affect their abilities to properly communicate in person, not just with parents, not just with uh, potential uh, hiring, hirees, hire, hiring um, forces, so on and so forth, but with their own peers, as we've seen uh, in the example that Wade so boldly uh, communicated. And then she moves on to social media versus interpersonal and she uses a good quotation here from Hussein Shahin in uh, the publication of Telegraph, quoting that people are increasingly preferring quick and frequent engagement 
for the instant updates on news or then a prolonged chat and finding ways to catch up with friends. Right? So she's defining her terms so that we can understand and why she's arguing for the position she's taking up. And there's more to the article, okay, uh, that is here, but it's not so long that you can't read it yourself. And rather than just listen to me and watch me read an article online, which is not very easy, you can uh, certainly read that article yourself. And if it's a topic that you find compelling or engrossing in one way or another, you know, you can take that emphasis, that feeling, and leap off into a lengthier written discussion along the same lines. So there's some food for thought. Okay, that brings us to the kind of end of our discussion for this week. Pretty quick uh, summation here. I'm gonna wrap up as I always do with the um, notes for this week's reading. I think there's a rough in chapter 25 and 27 or the end of level two of Ready Player. I like to kind of give my sign off here because sometimes people don't, they reach, some students reach out to me and say, I, I'm reading the book, I like the book. I don't really need to have you walk us through uh, the uh, finer points of the plot. So I appreciate that. Uh, for those of you who still want to stick around and um, you know enjoy the PowerPoints from chapter 25 to 27, stick with me and we'll do that right now. Otherwise, I will sign off and see you next week. Take care, everyone. Okay, if you're still here, I'm going to assume that you probably uh, do want to go through the PowerPoint portion of the chapter 25. So I'm going to put those on screen. Again, you'll miss my face until my last or my second sign off. But uh, you should still be able to hear my voice as I walk through each of the steps. Okay. I'm going to screen share the PowerPoint. And I'm going to do a slideshow from the beginning. Okay, so we pick up in chapter 25 and we finally learn the fate of Geisel. Remember that previously uh, Wade had grown closer to Geisel and Shaker. And after he had finally gotten a hint of his friend age as to where the JP might be hiding, specifically in the big white house on another planet where he goes and lives the game of Gork and collects uh, 16 different trophies finally blows the whistle in order to get a foil covered jade key, which is going to come up later in uh, this discussion. He heads home. But when he heads home, he is immediately frustrated. He still doesn't know what test he has to take in order to unlock the next gate. And he finds out that not only is that stymied him, but the Sixers specifically Sorrento, has found the next key, the crystal key. And so he feels like now there's no chance for him to win. He's lost Artemis. He's in the depth of despair and he starts to formulate plans. He's gonna pick a song to listen to or whistle rather on his way down to the ground once he scales the walls of his apartment complex and he's gonna throw himself off. But uh, he's saved by the bell, quite literally in a sense, as his phone begins to chime. And it's a message from Shoto that suggests Daito has died or has been killed. So first of all, he meets up with Shoto uh, on his vessel, which is in the Oasis, which is a large interplanetary crawler called the Kurosawa, named after um, the famous Japanese film director Akira Kurosawa, who directed such classics as Ron and Flow of Blood and Seven Samurai. 
And we learned that the ship is modeled after one that we call the Bebop from the series Cowboy Bebop. You can see a version of this ship here over on the left hand. So you can the right hand side. Um, Shoto explains that Daito was murdered. And at first, they think that this is just the result of his avatar being killed in the Oasis. But uh, as he explains on page 242, um, the six years broke into Daito's apartment, pulled him out of his happy chair, and threw him off of his balcony in the 33rd floor. 43rd floor. However, the entire incident is caught on camera. So the Sixers have unwillingly given the Gunters some major ammo if they can use it. Remember that they covered up Wade, uh, uh, the destruction of Wade's home and the murder of his family by saying it was a meth lab that had blown up in the stack. I'm sure they can come up with some kind of similar nonsense. Uh, to disguise Daito's murder, but at least there's some real evidence of, of that that tells the truth. That leads us into a uh, relatively quick uh, or short chapter in 26, which is uh, the unicorn. So while he's fooling around with the key, looking at that foil that it can grab, he puts it on a screen and analyzes it. In one of those beautiful moments where life imitates art, he realizes that he's doing the same sort of thing that the Harrison Ford character Decker did in the film Blade Runner, which means he's enhancing an image while a crime scene. And when he looks at the foil in his own image enhancer and says the word unicorn, you realize that it is, it is a scene from that movie, Blade Runner. The wrapper had folded itself into silver origami, one of the most iconic, iconic images from the film. So he realizes that he's got to go to a version of the Tyrell book uh, and take what's called a Voight Comp. And you can see over here on the right hand side a, uh, an example of a Voight Comp machine which was to use to test um, Android to see if they were really Android or if they were humans. Because at this point in the future, as the story takes place, Androids are so human or lifelike that sometimes it's very difficult to tell whether they are uh, human or not. And there's a, there's a fear that if Android will learn to pass as human, they may try to take human jobs or uh, live the life of the human or attain human rights, when really their purpose is to exist as manufactured laborers to make the world um, easier for humans to live in and uh, create convenience for human ends. Uh, but sometimes these really intelligent androids will rebel and perhaps be killed other humans, which is a big no-no. So they have to create a special uh, version of the police that uh, goes after and uh, destroys these androids. And those police are called Blade Runners. And that's the uh, job of the character Decker, played by Harrison Ford in the film. But when Wade goes to the Voight, uh, the uh, Tyrell building and finds a Voight Compass, of course, a keyhole enters or opens up the machine and inserts the JT, and he is taken to a bowling alley? Yeah, that's right. Uh, the virtual portal leads him to a 70s style bowling. Interesting. But not too long after exploring said bowling alley, he sees a game room. Um, in the uh, on the premises, and as he described here, there was a rush of violent men, and the war what sounded like a hurricane tearing through the bowling. His feet began to slide across the carpet, and he realized that his avatar was being pulled towards the set game as if a black hole had opened up again. 
And as the vacuum yanks him into the game room, he spots a whole host of classic 80s video games, very similar to going to the planet Arcadia or Arcadia. Don't confuse these two instances. He says, but I could now see that my avatar was being drawn to one game in particular, but still alone in the very back of the room. And that is the video game called Black Tiger, uh, published by Capcom in 1984, I believe. Um, and originally called Black Dragon, as you can see from the artwork on the uh, console here. Or the machine, rather. It wasn't a console, it was, on a, it was only an arcade level game. And he writes from Anorax Almanac, Chapter 23, Verse 234. That um, Halliday wrote that whenever his parents would start screaming, he'd sneak out of the house and ride his bike through like a bowling to play Black Tiger because it was a game that he could beat, but just unfortunately. Wade begins to sense a pattern when he the gate challenges. And so the first gate would place me inside of one of Halliday's favorite movies. Now, the second gate had put him inside one of his favorite video games. While I was pondering the implication of this pattern, a message began to flash in my display that described gay. And here's where I said, come on, Wade. The pattern is pretty obvious. You should be able to suss it out, right? Movies, first board game, now video game, Black Tiger. The third one should be music, some kind of song that he's going to be responsible for. To complete the sort of trifecta, the trinity, if you will, of, of media, movies, video games, music. Right? You might say novels, but in the future, it doesn't seem like novels are as critical as as were. <laughs> so, upon defeating the game, he's a pretty good uh, game player after all. He says something strange. That had never occurred when he beat me in the game. One of the wise men from the dungeon appears on the screen with a speech to him, reading, Thank you, I'm in your debt. Please accept the giant robot as a reward. And here we've got some more foreshadowing. You can see the giant robot there just over the shoulder of a more famous uh, icon. And he selects as his robot the giant transforming. The Piedemann, uh, or no, sorry, the giant transform, the giant transforming robot in Leopardon, which is used by Spider Man, an incarnation of our own Western Spider Man, uh, that appear in Japanese television in the late 70s. Upon receiving the robot, the wise men fade away, and he is seen, uh, he sees an image of here. Of a five pointed star in a red circle. And he knows immediately that that's a reference to Rush 2112. So we enter the Temple of in chapter 27 to end level two. And he knows the symbol right away because he explains that Rush, the band, Rush, had been Halliday's favorite from his teens onward. He once reviewed or revealed in an interview that he coded every single one of his games. Including the Oasis, while listening exclusively to their album, often referred to three members as the Holy Trinity. God. And again, we get these over the head references, right? But luckily, we're going we're to stick our proverbial catcher's mitts up in the air and notice that ah, here's another religious reference. And again, this is something that Mr. Fowler likes to sort of harp on or, or play up to right? because Wade explained early on in the book that he doesn't believe in any kind of sacred system. He doesn't believe in beliefs that define or codify perhaps even something that we would see as more traditional. Instead, he feels that um, the world the universe is cruel and he is alone. And that you know, existence itself is like unto a joke. Nevertheless, he selects the name Tarzan 
Nevertheless, he finds himself hunting for an Easter egg. As we almost approach said holiday, right? We get that uh, religious analogy here. Um, kind of in the, lurking in the background. He's after a grail object, right? Not a grail like the actual parts of those after, but a grail like object, an Easter egg, right? And a more ascendant, perhaps, object, right? Even the grail itself. He's joined on his quest by two other errant knights. Parzal right? is joined by Artemis and H. Uh, there is, and then we have another reference to the our Trinity reference. And um, we reference uh, various um, sources here, like Indiana Jones, his three songs, the Holy Trilogy of Star Wars, so on and so forth, as he described earlier in the novel. Here's another example. Now, 2112, uh, Wade uh, writes about the creation of the song, and it's an epic seven part uh, piece, you know, uh, styling in at 20 minutes, which tells the story of an anonymous rebel living in the year 2012 when creativity and self expression are outlawed. The symbol of the five pointed star is actually that used by. The Solar Federation, which is controlled by a group of priests described as the priests of Syrians, who, of course, worship in the temple of Syria. And he said it was those lyrics that tell him where the key was hidden. Now, real quickly, 2112 was originally based on a novel called Anthem by author Anne Lynn or Anne Rand. Um, there's some debate on how you pronounce that. I've always thought, pronounced them as Anne Rand, but some people say Anne Rand. Maybe it is Anne Rand, but I always said Anne Rand. I'm going to put that up and criticize me uh, for not being able to figure out how to pronounce that. <laughs> I, mean, I don't, please don't send me that. Just if, if you happen to know and you want to drop me an email and it's actually Anne Rand, great. All the more. Kudos for you. But in the meantime, in between time, I just wanted to tell you that she was writing, or she's known for two books, Atlas Shrugged and The Fountainhead. And at, they're both really long novels. And they're, they're both sort of reflective about the same thing. Um, Atlas Shrugged is about a group of people, or, or sorry, one, one guy joined by a group, hired by a group to create like an, uh, I think like a railway system that goes along the circumference of the earth or something like that. Whereas the fountainhead is about an uncompromising um, architect who believes that his greatness is being challenged by the people who are giving him money uh, for him to design this uh, incredible edifice. And so you get into Anne Rand's uh, philosophy of That's not really relevant to what we're talking about. But I just want to tell you that Anne Rand stopped in the middle of Atlas Shrug and wrote an entire other novel, Anthem, just to kind of take a break before she returned to the novel. Okay. Kind of interesting. So here in the Temple of Syrians, Wade realizes that uh, he's going to have to give an offer. But what kind of offering would it be? He tries a number of things. Um, he tries the key. The, you know, um, or, no, he doesn't have the key yet. He tries the part on. He tries the, to put the robot there. That doesn't work. He tries to put the coin there. That doesn't work. Um, so he checks the lands. And he says, I found the waterfall near the southern edge of the city, just inside the curved wall of the atmosphere. And as soon as he found the he activates his jet boots to fly over the river and pass through the waterfall itself. There's a really cool passage that talks about how his haptic suit kind of recreates or, sim or simulates the, uh, the, the sense of the water falling on him. But then he says, I heard a rumble of grinding stone, a trap door opened beneath him. And he looks deep into the hole and sees that um, a brilliant shaft of light 
uh, descends from another hole in the roof of the cave, and he goes into the chamber. So described as a tiny cube shape with a rough hewn stone standing in the wall, and embedded in the stone that first was an electric guitar. So then, of course, we have this uh, instead of the sword in the stone, as you see over here on the right, we have the guitar and the ice on the left. Is it a 1974 Gibson Les Paul, like Alec Lifeson played? Um, Alec Lifeson being one of these brush? Don't know. Uh, I'm not a guitar guy. But um, we obviously have the sword and the stone interview calling back to the quest for the Holy Grail, calling back to Wade's namesake, Percival or Parzival. And we have yet more sacred information. Luckily for us, they explains he spent many years on this uh, guitar hero, <laughs> training for the inevitable moment where he could uh, use a virtual act, as he describes, to shred his way to it. He plays the song Discovery, this, which describes the heroes um, and the song's discovery of the guitar in the Exact scenario he is in. He completes the challenge and the guitar itself melts immediately away into a key, and the stone on which it was embedded flashes a, a scroll of text, which is his final clue the clue to the crystal gate, which reads The first was ringed in red metal, the second in green stone, the third is clear as crystal. And then not be unlocked alone. So they're talking about the gates, the gate of red metal that opened uh, in the poster for war, for war. Then the green stone that opened in the void contest allowed him to go and play black tight. So now he's got the crystal key, but where's the crystal gate? He has an idea. Had the Sixers played the song and discovered the message, he wonders? Well, he doubts it. They would have just pulled the guitar from the stone and returned to the temple. And he says, if that's true, they probably didn't play the song, they probably didn't get the clue about the third gate. So now he's ahead. He's got a little extra advantage. But can he make use of the extra advantage? He thinks he knows where the final crystal gate is. It's in the castle of Anorak, and which is itself located in Smithsonian, which was a painstaking recreation of a fantasy world that Halliday had played in the high school Dungeons and Dragons. And we end the next, or we end level two and anticipate his voyage to Sophonia in level three. And we're just going to exit here real quickly. Planet Dune, if you've seen the film adaptation of Ready Player One, which I know a few of you have, um, but uh, that's roughly equivalent to Planet Dune. It's not called Sophonia, it's called Planet Dune. But uh, we'll have to pick that up next time. So that's it for this week. Like I said, kind of a short week, or at least it felt short to me uh, when I was recording the video. We'll see how short it is. But as always, if you have questions, concerns, reach out to me, email me. I'm here to help you out. And, uh, until then, stay thinking critically, or keep thinking critically, keep reading, take care of yourself. All right, I'll talk to you next time. Bye now.